Uh, uh, I'm Bryce. I'm here to introduce everyone. Um, first, first up is Alan, and I think everyone here knows Alan. Or has heard of Alan. So, <laughs> don't need a big introduction for him. But Alan's actually one of the guys that got me pumped up about organics when I started. So, don't assume. Introduce him. Where did he start? Oh, I know. Yeah, I'm gonna get there. Just relax. <laughs> Alan uh, got me pumped up about organics. He farms at Nesbitt, Manitoba, and he's tried lots of different varieties. And he's going to tell you about you know what his good and bads are, I guess, and the biggest case for mustard. Uh, good day. Sorry, my throat's been fighting something here, and maybe it's been four days of too much talking. Okay. Well, no, I, I did two two, day, two days of HM before this, so I'm well primed. <laughs> Um, yeah, like Bryce said, we've been organic for, uh, we started our first crop of organic in 2002. Um, we were a PMU operation with an export hay market, which uh, after what I've learned now is very bad for your uh, soil health on the alfalfa side, export all the nutrients, but it's, uh, it's a slow learning process that's coming around here. I was just going to go through a quick little, I know I'm supposed to be selling mustard here, but just the basics of our farm. We're doing some sweet clover production there. Um, we'll, actually this field here is going to be yellow mustard next year. We combine the clover for seed. Um, we use peas and oats intercrop. We graze yearlings on it for, this is what we also use for uh, soil health building here. We'll put mustard seed into this the following year. Um, some fields, we'll just graze our sweet clover here. We'll, same thing again, we'll throw mustard and a bunch of wheat onto this the following year. Um, I can't tell what I'm going to put on this field because that would not help my sales pitch for what I'm going to uh, <laughs> try to sell you on. But anyway, um, Sorry, what's that be? yeah, no, 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 Dan. <laughs> um, so this is the first year we've done this. We're feeding cows right on the land with the bale roller. We've bale grazed before on pasture, but this is actually an alfalfa field that we're rolling out. So we're hoping to get it very well covered for nutrient wise. And. This was my five-year-old son, Zach, in our bumper winter wheat crop there. All excited to try the brand new swath we just bought. So we, uh, we have a lot of fun working together. Uh, same thing winter wheat there. That was that was the highlight of my year. Because um, that field didn't get hailed out. <laughs> uh, okay, on to mustard. Uh, I started about, oh, four years ago looking for an intercrop that we could throw in the mix. I've got a friend who works for Wado doing uh, plot trials with canola and peas. and and canola isn't uh, a very good word in organic, so <laughs> and not an option for us, so we had to look for another uh, brassica in the mix there. So I thought, well, we'll try this pea and mustard mix. So the first year we grew pea, mustard, and oats together and worked out fairly well. And at that time, it was about a 55-cent crop. Um, the oats kind of choked out the pea and mustard in certain spots, so from now on, we're kind of sticking to more pea mustard or a straight mustard. Um, so this field here was a plow down last year, a seven way mix. Uh, the only problem was the wild mustard, or sorry, wild millet came up about the same time as mustard did and I truthfully should have worked it under. Um, mustard's fairly competitive, it gets a head start, but if it gets lagged behind there, it does just never quite catches up. Um, this field here actually was my field of dreams. We had, it was an alfalfa field for four years it spread manure on it. It had um, broken up twice there, and I broadcast mustard on on the oh, what would have been the uh, end of May, roughly. And so we actually just sow our mustard with a Balmar. We go out about one inch, or try to incorporate it so it's roughly about an inch in the ground. Uh, Ten to twelve pounds the acre, so the seed cost is very reasonable. We're roughly looking at say a buck a pound for the seed that we bring in. Um, the year before, we had a winter wheat stand that had got um, port, or basically winter killed, so we sowed mustard on the 7th of June. And uh, about 10 days later, it had about four inches of rain, and, and it turned out being a bumper crop after. So, so far, we've seen it do fairly well on a wet or a dry year. So this field, like I said, this was my uh, 100 acres of straight mustard that we had in last year there. Um, it looked every bit as good as the neighbor's canola field that was a half mile away from there and nice lean to it. I was, like I said, pretty pretty excited about it, but then we had a 
pretty bad hailstorm came through and kind of wiped it out. So we ended up getting about four bushels of the acre. So I don't know where that one was, uh, <laughs> ever would have really ended off at the end of it, but um, we did have, like I said, um, a couple fields like that. And actually that storm came through and hit fields that were 10 miles apart. So I really don't have, as far as numbers went, what last year's mustard potential would have been. The year before on that mustard field that we had where the winter week was, we were been averaging I think we cleaned out 755 pounds the acre on it. Um, that was net. The um, we straight cut that field last year. We had to leave a little bit longer, being so the end of June, or sorry, the 12th of June there. And so we probably combine the end of September there. But it's a really nice crop to uh, to grow in your rotation just for that reason alone that you can actually have something that you can straight cut and not have to. Um, Swath it. This year with all the hail damage and that, we basically had to swath it just to retrieve it. And that was fine too. We just had the roller on the back there and swaths never moved anywhere. Um, see what else I have there? Not back to that <laughs> Oh, this was just, yeah, this was that same field there that we ended up swathing there. And, and even swathing is a little bit fluffy. It was actually very easy to deal with and, and combine's a real treat. It's got to be down to 9% moisture um, and you, cannot swath it on the green side. It's, got to be, it's not like canola, you have to be about 75% on the uh, mature side for it to come in there. Um, uses uh, or places for it, like I said, for us, alfalfa, after an alfalfa um, breaking, it's working really well. It's working nice as a you know, flax replacement. We <coughs> used to a lot of flax, that was kind of my main cash crop along with winter wheat where the mustard is so much, well, it's half the money to seed. Combine is, is a joy now instead of a nightmare and waiting until after a frost and trying to beat the, the first snowfall or whatever with flax. So mustard is really, like I said, um, taken off. We finally got a brass kind of rotation, which we never had before I think for the wild stuff. They do color sort this stuff. So it's, it's not that if you have a field with a little bit of wild mustard on it that you can't grow it. I know some guys have been very concerned about that one, but that's not really a, an issue at all now. Um, the other thing we were looking for was some stubble to try to sow winter wheat in. We've had probably six, two years out of six where we've lost our um, winter wheat stands due to winter kill. So I was looking for a, a stubble that I could drill into. So my, my perfect rotation is an alfalfa field break and that we could spray it manure on to build our nutrients back up and then have a, a yellow mustard crop and then go into winter wheat. And that's what this field here, because of the canopy being knocked back there with the hail, we actually had to go and take the disc out because we had so many alfalfa volunteers coming back um, or else we would have drilled right into it there. But that would be kind of my ideal rotation and then winter wheat would go back um, and I'll broadcast clover seed on it and then I'll see what happens after that. Um, then the, the other field we had this year, we had a, a pea, oat, or sorry, pea mustard and alfalfa, a three-way mixture there. And it actually did very well too. <coughs> Definitely you notice where the nutrients were there, the mustard is about half the height of the, uh, the field that was a mile down the road with the fertility there. The alfalfa did very well and it actually took over the mustard. So guys gonna have to watch that one. Maybe we'll sow the alfalfa a couple weeks later if we're gonna try to intercrop it again with clover or alfalfa. And then on the wheat side, or as far as we're cleaning, we also have a quick clean where we just run it through for the peas and mustard. So it's really simple at harvest time. We'll take the, uh, just set the screener up right in front of the grain bins and we can screen the mustard out one way and the peas out the other way. And the demand, um, I never heard of what they were ever using it for until the last couple of years here. And now it sounds like this mustard seems to be a very uh, popular food ingredient, I guess is where most of it's going to. We have three different buyers. Now, I'm not saying that they don't all go back or two of them don't go back to the same original buyer, but um, it seems like the man's fairly good. I just got off the phone with a guy from the States here and he gave us a dollar fifteen for new crop contracts. And I know farmer director's talking about a dollar a pound here the other day too, so we we're uh, very excited about that. Um, is that US farmer? No, sorry, that's no, Canadian. I <laughs> oh. guess that's got <laughs> Next up, we have Larry Marshall um, it's from Northern Saskatchewan. Uh, he's here to talk about the app to make this case for that. The wind. 
So we have a, um, a John Deere combine and uh, we straight cut it. Uh, I might as well start with the, the negatives on hemp because uh, um, some people don't like uh, growing hemp because they've had problems with it uh, uh, wrapping up in the combine. And um, I think the major reason there is they just don't wait, they're waiting too long to harvest. And if, if you go into it, you can see how green the hemp is when the combine's going through it. And then the, the fibers don't come off the outside of the stem, so you don't get wrapping around the, um, the parts on the combine. And the other major thing is dealing with the stubble after. And um, what we're doing is what comes out of the combine, we put through a forage harvester and it just gets chopped up and blown out onto the land and then we just use a, uh, a tandem disc to uh, disc it in. And, and often we'll seed our green manure crop the next year by just putting the, the, um, the pea seed out on top of the ground and, and then just working it in with, with one working with the disc. Um, I feel that, that hemp is a, I feel like I'm on Dragon's Den. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I, I feel hemp is, is a, a very easy sell. I, I'm very passionate about hemp. It's, it's, it's treated me very well and, and uh, it's treated our farm very well. And, and I, I think the, um, there's so much market out there for organic hemp that I think it's, uh, it's got lots of potential for many people to get into it. And uh, right now, the value of it is so high the new contracts are, are about a buck eighty a pound our 10-year long-term average of growing hemp is uh, over 750 pounds of clean seed per acre at a dollar eighty so you're looking at that's a pretty easy sell you're getting over a thousand dollars an acre wow. there and um, it, it's such an amazing plant uh, uh, the, the things that it can do uh, like you can you can see the um, another crop down with it and and you wonder why it, it's so aggressive against the weeds, but later on in the season, the leaves start falling off and then the light gets through. So if you have a nurse crop underneath, it just uh, grows quite well there. You leave that tall stubble all over winter, it catches snow, it protects those uh, uh, plants till the, till the next year. And then if it's gonna be a hay crop or that, we just run a pea roller over it. Those stems break off because the microorganisms break it right at the ground and you just kick the stems and they fall over. So you can just knock them down to the ground and then the hay crop grows up. It's a frost tolerant uh, crop, uh, six degrees, negative six before it affects it, and, and even less than uh, negative six in the spring. Uh, nothing seems to hit it in the spring. Like the volunteers that grow up, they, they don't die at all. But in the fall, it takes negative six before it shuts the plant down. So it's sure nice, we're, we're, we're in the north, and it's sure nice to know that you've got a crop that's not gonna fail from, from frost. And um, the, what, what it uh, bounces back, it is a true weed. It, it, uh, it just keeps coming back. Uh, uh, we had 100% hail on two of our fields last year that um, they were up about this high. There was no leaves left on it at all. Most of the stems were bent over. Within, and the, the hail adjuster, we got 100% hail on there. And those fields all came back to yield exactly the same amount of any of our other fields. <laughs> and, uh, uh, by the time the inspector got there, uh, he thought, well, this doesn't look like it's been hailed, it's all, all leafed out, but uh, they go in there and check, you know, for the damage and that, and there was damage on every plant. And all the stems that were broke off, um, they're still hanging on by some of the fibers. The stem turns around and grows back up and has a super tall plant. And, and you look down there and you wonder how all the nutrients can go right through that little bit of fiber that's left coming up there. But uh, it's amazing how it, it bounces back. It's, uh, it's got uh, incredible potential there. Um, you have to grow the right variety for the latitude. We're in the north, we grow the dwarf variety. What you want is a plant that's around four to six feet tall. That way you get the really good uh, weed competition, but then you don't get something that's too hard to handle. Anything up above six feet and, and you get a lot of uh, uh, wrapping problems. We seed a, a higher, um, uh, 30 pounds to the acre, a higher rate, and what happens then is you get all the stems just coming straight up, you get a much more even crop. If we seed less, we've got a wavy crop and it's hard to set the, the straight cut header to, to get this, the tops of the buds off there, but if you seed really thick, it's a more even crop, and you have just one bud on the top of every plant. Because if the plant has space, you get branches out with buds on those branches. Then you have to go quite a bit lower with your harvester and you're putting more fiber through the combine. So we're just trying to pick off the buds off the top of the, the plant and put them through the combine. And when you've got a nice thick even crop, as you see in the, those pictures, you can 
keep the header right up and it's very smooth going. We can combine as fast as we want to go, but we, we have to keep it down to three to four miles an hour just to try and save all that seed that's coming because you've got green leaf material coming through the combine with it. So we're, we're throttling back to try and save the seed. But, uh, um, and most of the new combines, uh, uh, they go through it really quite easily. Uh, um, some of the older combines need some modification. Um, Do you solid seed or row crop? We're solid seeding, yeah. Uh, you can row crop too, but when you row crop, that's when you get that branching too. So you're gonna you're gonna have you'll get the same yield, no problem there. But you'll be putting more product through your um, through your combine, and you'll have more more weeds. So you have to deal with them a different way. So by by solid seeding, we're seeding on a 10 inch center, but uh, I don't think it really matters what uh, what you do is if you've got a nice thick crop there, it jumps up really fast. You don't want to seed early, and that's the beauty of hemp. We can see that we use July 1st as our cutoff date for last seeding and there's no other crop that we can do that. Uh, um, we like to seed the first week in June, uh, but um, if we've got any fields with wild oak pressure on them, then, then we seed those later. Um, so we make sure we've got good flush of wild oaks before we seed. And the nice thing about seeding later in June, the ground is nice and warm and that crop just jumps right up. We never seed uh, uh, right after a rain. If we get a rain, we usually wait a, a day or wait till we can, uh, if we say we've already worked it and got a rain, we'll actually go out and even harrow it uh, before we work it because uh, um, when we go out and work it right on real wet ground, we're just activating more weeds to grow and that. So we, um, but other than that, uh, um, it's a very easy to seed, uh, three quarters of an inch deep and it likes to be, be packed firm on top, but it doesn't like, uh, um, uh, hard pan. It, it should be uh, um, nice loose soil that it, it does best in. What type of drill do you use? There? We use a seed hawk now and uh, um, it seems to, to do a really good job. Um, we harvest at uh, uh, around ideally 15 to 20 percent moisture but we start at around 25 percent moisture so that plant is really green. So we bring it in and, and put it in through a dryer and uh, we use a, uh, a natural gas uh, batch dryer, uh, uh, but uh, for people just starting, you know, those old uh, uh, circular um, re recycling batch dryers, they work excellent, you know, and uh, uh, they dry it down. And, but you can use aeration too. I, I like to have it a bit drier before it goes into aeration because uh, some of the really wet stuff, it's, uh, it's hard to do. And, and when you have it in aeration, you have to move it. Um, after a day or two just because you get some hot spots in there. Um, uh, you, you have the tall stubble in the fall to, um, which is really good for catching snow and uh, um, the amount of fiber that's produced from all that hemp, it, I figure it's really good working back into the soil. Like leave, don't even think about uh, selling stubble. Um, because uh, leave that to the conventional guys and uh, put that all back in because there's a, a lot of beautiful fiber there. Um, and, and leaving lots of high organic matter. Um, I said it was a great nurse crop. Uh, um, the price, uh, I figure, is the selling point on it. Uh, uh, that dollar eighty is is pretty sweet. So, uh, but between its great weed control and its its high price and uh, uh, the amount of fiber you're putting back in the soil, I, I recommend you give hemp a try. <laughs> What's that? How do you feel? Oh, okay. It, it likes around uh, 100 pounds of nitrogen, actually. So it is a high feeder. So we usually grow it after a, a um, we're breaking up alfalfa, or we do a 40-10 um, silage pea or fallow bean plow down before we grow it. So you, you don't want to grow it to, on um, on a piece that you've had a crop with the year, year before because uh, you'll just have a wreck there. So it, it needs that uh, the good nutrient. But um, um, how much water does it take? Yeah, it, it takes a, lot, a fair bit of water because there's a lot of growth there, but uh, uh, it doesn't like too much. Like uh, uh, when it's, when you're first seeding it, it doesn't like to have wet feet. So because what will happen, it will stall, it will just germinate, and it'll kind of stall there if it's, if it's waterlogged. But uh, but actually, um, it's, I don't know. It'd, it'd be a higher feeder than than wheat, I guess, wouldn't it? For the water. Yeah.
Yeah, there, there are people that are swathing it, like, uh, and it's mostly over in the irrigation in uh, Alberta where they're swathing it. They're using the, the gore variety and they're swathing it, and they're, but they're only leaving it down for a day to maximum three days just to get the, the leaf material to. But they're swathing it green. They're swathing it green, yeah, okay. and still going through green. Because if, if you put the put it through when it start when those stems start drying, yeah. those fibers will come off, and yeah. you'll so have. You the, the what what you're looking for as soon as you you see the seeds kind of protruding protruding out of their they're in a little bract, yeah. and as soon yeah. as you see them uh, poking through and uh, you see the seeds there, that's the time to uh, um, test it and uh, and see where it's at. Does, does it shell off? Yeah, it shells once it gets dry, but uh, it's usually down uh, below 13 and now when it gets into a shelling, then, right. unless it's a real big wind or that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks. Up next is the uh, Mollets from Brandon, Manitoba. And, uh, they are going to talk about spell. Yeah, that's how it's Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, you might have got to tear it off. Yeah, it's all I think you got it on now. What now? Yeah. Ah. There we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. And one thing I'd like to know, is there any conventional farmers in here? Fantastic. like to see them. <laughs> uh, I guess our thing up there. Uh, we grow spelt, and I'm not a speaker. I just as soon be in my tractor with 50 acres of green manure plow, plow down. And I'd be a lot more comfortable, <laughs> but I'll do the best I can with what I got. We grow spelt, we've been growing spelt since 2004, and every year, this will be our 13th year, and our market has been increasing. We started with four 50-pound bags a month <clears throat> was our market, and now we're doing at least 130 bags a month. It's just been growing and growing on us. We're not really looking for any more markets, but if one comes along, we'll look at it and decide whether we're gonna do it or not. So, I got some pictures. This is what I seed with, the spelt. You're going back in the 70s now. <laughs> That's the small cedar, the, just the one disc early, the small fields I sow with that. And we sow at anywhere from two to three bushels to the acre. Because once I get it in the ground, I will harrow it several times. I'll harrow it two or three times, depends on the weather. And the last time I harrow it, the field will be turning green. And then again, when the crop is four or five, six inches high, I'll harrow it again. It's the most frustrating job I've ever done on the farm, is go out and harrow a beautiful looking field. But it doesn't seem to hurt it. The only time I hurt it is when the, what rained. We got an, an inch and a half of rain a couple of days after we did it, and the stuff that I buried couldn't get back up again because it crusted. And I'll bounce all over the place here on it. <clears throat> when do you, now uh, the crop's up. When do you seed it? Uh, in early, May, mid-May? We like to sow it pretty much as early as we can get on the field. At least some of it. Because it takes 112, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> it takes 112 to 115 days to mature. So we like to put it in early. This is one of our best crops we grew. This one went 125 bushels to the acre. Mm -hmm. But that's in the hull. Yeah. And when you de hull spelt, you get one quarter of that. So now you're back <laughs> down to uh, 25 to 30 bushels. How much you sell it for? 
But this was a good crop. This is the only crop out of the, this is 13 crops we'll be putting in this spring. <coughs> this is the only one that stayed standing up. Scalp is prone to lay down, and it pretty much does every year. But this was a good crop. It stood up and swathed good and harvested good. That's a little close. <laughs> That's the same feel, I think, just from a different direction. And that's on alfalfa breaking. And one thing we found, like, it's alfalfa breaking, but our alfalfa had leaf cutter bees on it for two years prior to that. And we combined the alfalfa in the fall, and there was a good crop and lots of straw. So the straw choppers spitting it out and putting it down. And when we went in that with the disc, it was like plowing a like a compost, like the first six inches or nine inches on that field was just brown, just loaded with all kinds of product. And it seems to work really good. We don't do the bees anymore, but we're working on that too. <clears throat> we bought ourselves a, <clears throat> a flail mower. So instead of selling our alfalfa hay to the neighbor and he, he's taking it home, <coughs> we're gonna mow the fields and just mow them down and just spread the stuff back on the field and then when the weeds and stuff start coming up again we just mow it again and we're going to start doing that and see how it works for us hey, this is a little close i'm the combine driver yeah that's pat <laughs> my wife is the combine driver she drives the combine i haul the grain and that was <coughs> five miles from home i have a Green trailer I pull with my tractor holds 400 bushels, and then I rent, borrow the neighbor's truck that holds 400 bushels, and it keeps you running. Like I go home, come back, the truck's right full again. That was just one I threw in. <clears throat> That's actually a spelt field that was starting the muster was coming up on it, so I just decided to work it down, and then actually to blend it into another field when we were doing the farmers market that was a uh, field we grew potatoes on and we never got it back into the field so i just sewed it to spelt one spring and then it was going to be spelt so it was going to wind up being different next year so we worked it down so it actually joined into the rest of the field that's what the swath looks like a lot of it like it has a pile of straw Two years ago, our spelt grew as high as I am. <laughs> and it, like I said, it'd be anywhere from six inches to nine inches tall when you go to swath it. You put pickup reels on your swather and you put lifters on, and the swath's really good. Like it doesn't seem to matter which direction you go, and it swaths easy. When you go back to the combine, that's not a big combine, that's antique nowadays. And it combines really easy. It just goes through like it's not a problem. The old straw chopper is just a snort because there's a pile of straw coming out. And there's more straw than you could think of sowing another crop on the following year. We just let it stand there like that all winter. And then we go back in in the spring and harrow it a couple of times and then we work it down and we spend all next year working it in and getting all that straw went back into the soil. I had lots of people come along and said, boy, we'd like that straw. And I said, well, you can't have that straw. That straw that straw's mine. And I'm not sure how much nutrients we get out of it, but it's got to be a whole lot more than it is to let somebody else have it. And this is just a few pictures we picked up. And that's the one, you see all the holes on it? It has a hull on it. You do, want, do not want to de-hull it while you're combining. You put it in a bin and it will spoil. It will spoil in about two years. But this way you just dump it in the bin. We have 13 bins on the farm right now full of spelt. And we're processing spelt and delivering it to the market, to our markets, the people we supply. And we're doing 2013's crop. And the older it is, the better it is. It's like good, good wine. The older it is, the better it is. It just, we've had bakeries say that they wouldn't buy it unless it's two years old. But that was good farmers. 
Pardon? You know the farmer is? Better he is. But you can tell by that, it's bulky stuff. There, when I go to the bigger field, I find the other disc. <laughs> I'm still back in the 70s, but I like discers. They make a good job of the weed control when you're sowing. Instead of sowing it, sowing How many pounds of breaker? Pardon? How many pounds of breaker you put in? Well, we sow about two to three bushels to the acre, and it weighs 60 pounds of the bushel. After it's dehulled. We, we aim to get between 100 and 120. Uh, pounds of seed per acre. But just, just don't put on much more than the two bushels. And I don't find that double seeding it works well. And we do that because heroin is pretty aggressive about it. And the thicker the crop, the better weed control you got. And smell is pretty aggressive stuff. Like, I sometimes wonder, you know, what grows this high? So whether we're doing a good job of the weeds or you just can't see them. <laughs> Neighbors drive down the road, it looks pretty good. <laughs> well, if your yields are up there, you don't have to worry about it. I guess that's it. it. I guess that's it. We have, we have an on-farm dehauler and then cleaning process so that we can carry on and sell ready to mill. Spelt free, and then we have stone flour mills and rollers so that we can do finished products as well. Okay, I'm gonna throw some more things at you. If you like to grow spelt, I'll tell everybody you want to find a market or have a pretty good market in mind before you sow it. Because if you don't, you might. There's not a big market for spelt. Not a not a big market for spelt. So you want to, it's nice to have a market before you sow it or at least over the summertime because it takes a lot of bin space and you don't want to be sitting on four bins full of spelt that you can't sell. But there's a lot of market for it right now. There's different places, that, there's big companies and stuff that do it. <coughs> we don't look into that because everything we grow, we process and Grind in the flour and load it on the truck, and we deliver it right to our finish, right to our market. And you don't want to sow it like you wouldn't want to go in and sow it on a field that's been either wheat, oats, or barley the following year, because you don't want any of that stuff in your skull. Mike. Mike. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> What else have I got here? Now you're getting close to me at other times. Yeah, times. So, and <laughs> where am I going here? Enough. Can't read my own writing. Enough. Time. Pardon? Time. Time now? You're going to cut me off already. <laughs> <laughs> if I was sitting around the table, I'd feel a whole lot more comfortable drinking a cup of coffee and I'd do a better speech than this. Oh, this was Jerry, yeah. how much is it a bushel? How much is it a bushel? How much? Dollar wise? Yeah. We sell at a dollar a pound. 50 pound bags, $50. <coughs> $60 a bushel. Yeah. Yep. So $60 a bushel. And we've had people come in our yard and look at what we're doing, and they say, you're not charging enough for the hours you put in and the work you're doing. That sounds pretty good. Um, last, we have Froz from Inglis, I think. That's, that's where uh, you're from, right? And he's going to talk about um, what, to me, is kind of a new crop, but I have no clue about Catalina, so... I'm glad, waiting to hear what you have to say. Hello, hello. Talk, talk. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Frank. Uh, I'm a organic farmer since about almost 10 years now. I'd like to run around a little bit, so I don't get, that's my picture. Right? Um, 
uh, uh, introduction I wrote this year, so, so it's so so in Solomon. Uh, it's not a lecture in history or uh, astronomy. Uh, just keep an eye on those words we use, right? So it's so all similar. And Solomon just means soul, arm, and arm. There's two different languages that means the sun. So that's an ancient term for sun, 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 right? And here we make the bridge to the ancient crop. <coughs> I use uh, Camino seed is an ancient crop about using at least 5,000 years. They found it in mummy, in the stomach of mummy, saying you can't, by the way, at least 5,000 years in use. Uh, but probably they used the, the, the real, the canopy. Okay. And uh, it's coming from Europe to Canada and from Eastern Europe and from there, I guess, somewhere from Central, Central Asia. I don't know where it comes before. Uh, all the ancient culture, I guess, used it. <coughs> uh, I am organic farmer since 2006. I'm too loud to, to, that's okay. And I try a lot of different crops and crops rotation, uh, like heritage, fenugreek, spelt, uh, golden flax, uh, red clover, single cut, double cut, all kind of stuff. And uh, ended up uh, to fall in love with certain crops, that's uh, golden flax, which is an oil seed. And I knew nothing about Camarina four or five years ago, and uh, thanks to Laura, she pushed me pretty hard to go more into this seed. Uh, she saw potential and we saw potential in. We went to Vancouver to the trade show 2012 and we have to figure out what we do because this is a completely new crop. I'm in a learning curve to see what's possible and uh, our biggest problem to sell is nobody knows. So it's my job now in marketing to uh, educate the people, let them know and go more public. So I show you a poster here. That's the plant like right here, you see the plant in the middle you see the seed in our weight press and left that's the finished uh, bottle like you see here some bottles here so we do everything on our farm uh, growing uh, like seeding uh, harvesting cleaning I don't need this no yes for the people more okay <laughs> and uh, we do the cleaning nowadays since, since this winter because it's, it's hard to find organic certified organic cleaner they clean for you when you need it, and they clean a small amount of bush, not, not just the semi truck. <coughs> okay, uh, the farming part is this plant <coughs> is a, a brassica plant, a relative to mustard, but not really mustard plant. Got yellow uh, blossoms here and some white loads. Next one. Okay. If it looks like this, uh, about 70 to 75% when the plant getting yellowish, brownish on the heads, you start cutting it like canola. Uh, it's very easy to cut. It grows on margin land on any soil type. It doesn't matter which soil, <coughs> soil it is. It likes moisture, water, but not flooding. It likes heat, but not drought. Okay? And it's easy to cut. You can cut it on the ground and when it's, uh, leave it on the ground about at least two to three weeks. Get it really dry. It's not shattering out of the house, even when it's dry. That's the good thing. You know it, Ellen. And, and then when the harvest, it, it goes through the common to the uh, chaffa and it's gone. It's a very light fiber and it grows like a... <sighs> Because for me it's new too, so I have not lots of data. The data I have and I give to farmers, they want to know. I collect mostly from Europe. It's growing there about like last 20, 30 years. And they say about 7 to 10 kilogram per hectare. So that's about 10 to 20 pounds per acre here, right? So when I had a, a feed last year, I grew 14 pounds. In other part I grew, I grew the 16 pound. And it's a single crop, not, not dual crop. And the problem was the weather forecast says it, 
it rained, but it didn't. <coughs> and it says the second time it starts raining, but it didn't again. So I put it in without rain. I got no rain. I got two tenths of rain in May and June last year on my fields. So, but <coughs> some fields were almost no crop. You can see almost no crop. And some fields where it, the plant likes really nice, soft, like almost garden soil type of seed bed. And it grows very well. And here you see the swath on the better part of the field. And it yielded about 20 bushel per acre. Conventional farmers had about, had about, they had about 30 bushel per acre. And then other parts of the field got just 10 bushel per acre, which was bad. So then after harvesting, um, it should be not more than 10%, 11% moisture. I clean it as fast as possible, with, with, like put in the bin, and then I clean it as fast as possible. It holds better. I take the screenings out. I use the screenings to feed my chickens, <coughs> so I'm not wasting anything. And uh, the more residue on the ground, the better, because I, can, I use a plow every year, I plow it under, and then uh, I seed the next crop, or I seed the crop uh, with oats and clover. I use lots of clover for under seeding, red clover, uh, single cut or double cut, doesn't matter really. And in some fields I harvest the clover for a sprouting, a set them a sprouting seed. So, uh, how do you seed it? Uh, you very shallow, uh, broadcasting, and the best technique I figure out what the farmer say, uh, says me in Germany, they say just broadcasting, harrowing, and packing. Don't have to go deep. And I would recommend as a single crop, somewhere around 14 to 16 pounds, as a crop together with like oats or peas, for example, somewhere between 6 and 10 pounds. Okay? And like, uh, Market-wise, I have no idea. I can't tell you yet because it was introduced into Canada in 2008 to the government, some program, and they gave it to the farmer to try it out as, an ex as another future cash crop, but they didn't tell the farmer what to do with it. There was no market for it, and that's what my neighbor ended up having this in the seed, and he was organic. That's where I got the seed from about two years ago, or three years ago now. So now I have my own seed, I, it's certified organic, and what we do is we make the oil out of it, <coughs> and uh, we now in about 111 stores in across Canada, from Thunder Bay till Edmonton, and we like to bring to more and more stores, and the benefits, of, so why I'm doing this, crazy enough to do this, right? Uh, uh, this oil has so many potential for uh, like health benefits and I think it's one of the best oils in the world. No negative side on it and we are uh, working lots uh, going into like online market. We're working on them now, right now. So we have two lines, one, one branch goes into online, one branch is still a retail market. We practice responsive marketing, not brand marketing. And uh, when I buy seed, I pay 20 bucks per bushel. And yeah, it sells so far still slow because nobody knows the term Camelina. But uh, everybody loves Omega. And that's why this is the new Omega <coughs> oil. And I think this is a huge potential to go on the online market because there are hundreds of thousands of people out there, like vegan people, they like the omega-3 and 6 and 9, and they don't like fish oil, right? So this is the next big, big market. And we are in contact with people in the States, they like to buy it. So it's for us a learning curve. You can go really high and, and, and become like a good, a good a supply for those people or not. We, we don't know yet. It's, it's a very tough time and very, uh, lots to learn, like online and, and farming and cleaning, all this stuff together. And we are two person operation, my wife and me, so far. <laughs> okay, some questions later maybe? Uh, Franz, you said it was a new Omega. Is that because it's
balance, three, six, that's and nine balance. The omegas are balanced. The essential fatty acids are balanced in camelina. Is that yeah, there's that's two to one, one, yeah, ratio. Of Two, two omega, threes, one, yeah. two and omega, omega three and six are essential, right? And omega nine is not really so well established now. But the ratio doesn't really oh sorry, the ratio doesn't really matter in in terms of, of, of human health. It doesn't really matter. They they're selling omega some other nations a uh, uh, ratio one to four. But in the Western diet, we eat lots of uh, like fast food and they have this bad omega-6, those highly processed omega-6, so we have too much omega-6 in our bodies. And not enough that's why we think omega-6 is bad for but that's not true. Uh, this omega here is, it's the figure, it's the so-called parent omega, the original form of those molecular structure of omegas, and which is, uh, I have cards here you can pick up later, it's like uh, for cell membrane health and for, for brain health, for heart health, skin care, nails hair for women, it prevents its uh, uh, blood pressure, thrombosis, uh, arthritis, and studies shown that everybody says it's, it's, it's backed up to science, it's not me saying this, right? Okay. Even as I started medicine, but this was 50,000 years ago. Um, it helps tremendous to uh, autistic speech by children, and it helps for di uh, diabetes mellitus type 2 to regulate the blood sugar level in, in your blood.